Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First of all, I have a confession to make. You see, sometimes these honors can backfire on you. Recently, New York Magazine had a contest. Who are the 100 smartest people in New York? So I'm proud to say I made the list. I'm officially one of New York's 100 smartest people. However, in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and next year, they tell me that Lady Gaga is gonna push me off the list entirely. Now today, I wanna to talk about the future of humanity. The future as we explore the universe. Now, of course, it's very dangerous to make predictions. Let me quote from that great philosopher of the Western world, Yogi Berra. <laughs> Yogi Berra once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> and of course, he was famous for saying, on the road to the future, if you encounter a fork in the road, then be sure to take it. <laughs> well, we are gonna take that fork in the road. You see, I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists for the Discovery Channel, BBC Television, the Science Channel. And every time I interview these top scientists, I ask them the key question, the question of all questions, the question that has haunted scientists and philosophers, and that question is, is there intelligent life on the Earth? <laughs> well, I was watching the Cardassians on TV last night, and I'm convinced, nope, nope, not this planet, no intelligent life on this planet. However, sometimes people come up to me and they say, Professor, you're a physicist. What does a physicist do anyway? What do you guys do? Well, we are the people who invent the future. We invented the transistor, which makes possible the computer revolution. We invented the laser, which makes possible the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web which was written by a physicist to keep track of subatomic particles. In your living room, we invented television. We invented radio, microwaves for your oven. In the hospital, we invented the x-ray machine. We invented the MRI scan. And don't forget, we invented the space program. They're all physicists who did that. And whenever we invent something, we make a prediction. When we helped to invent the internet, one physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then maybe 50% of the internet could become pornography. <laughs> well, I've had the privilege of writing four New York Times bestsellers. My latest is The Future of Humanity. Did you know that prices for rockets have dropped incredibly, opening up the heavens for tourists even. For example, let me ask you guys a question. Raise your hand. How many of you have seen the movie The Martian starring Matt Damon? Raise your hand. Wow, most of you. Well, that Hollywood movie cost $100 million. But the Indian government sent a probe to Mars for $70 million. A Hollywood movie about going to Mars costs more than actually 
going to Mars. <laughs> and of course, if you've been reading the headlines, well, I was on CBS last night talking about the fact that, hey, there is a new discovery that has rocked the foundations of science. We have now photographed for the first time in history a black hole. It took us 100 years to do this. In 1916, Einstein's equation revealed a monster, a monster in outer space, and we finally photographed it, and it's made the front page of every newspaper. And what is a black hole? Well, a black hole is an object so massive that even light itself cannot escape. Think of it as a cosmic Roach Motel. Everything checks in, nothing <laughs> checks out. <laughs> and in my book, Physics of the Future, I talk about how we will live in the next 100 years. If you're looking for a job, if you're deciding on a major in college, if you want to encourage a young person to be part of the future, read the book. I have a whole set of chapters about jobs of the future. And in Physics of the Impossible, I talk about the world 500 years in the future. When we might have time travel, we might have starships, we might have teleportation. And I answer the question, what happens if you go backwards in time and meet your teenage mother before you were born and she falls in love with you? Well, if your teenage mother falls in love with you before you're born, you're in deep doo-doo if that happens. <laughs> and then in my latest, uh, before the present volume, The Future of the Mind, another bestseller, I talk about the fact that we physicists can now probe the blood flowing inside the brain with MRIs. We can actually see thoughts Thoughts as they are generated inside the living brain. This is amazing. We can now prove or disprove many old wives' tales. For example, there's an old wives' tale that everyone believes but no one can prove until now. That old wives' tale is, when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. <laughs> Absolutely true. We can show that when a man talks to a pretty girl, blood drains from the prefrontal cortex, and he starts to act mentally retarded. We can quantify this effect now. It's an amazing discovery. We can also, by the way, upload memories. We've done it in mice, monkeys, and next we'll upload simple memories in Alzheimer's patients. Think about that. We'll have a brain memory chip, a brain pacemaker. You'll push the button and simple memories come flooding into your hippocampus. You'll know where you live, what your name is, who your relatives are. And that could be a tremendous benefit for those people who have Alzheimer's. And some people think that maybe one day we'll have something like the matrix. You know, in the movie, The Matrix, reality itself was uploaded into your mind. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a rather strange question. How many of you, late at night, just before you go to sleep, how many of you have had that weird sensation that maybe, just maybe, life is an illusion? Maybe you're the only real person. Everything else is fake. Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Raise your hand. How many of you have ever had that strange feeling? Oh my God, you're all crazy. <laughs> so many crazy people in the audience. How can you be the only one in the world when I'm the only one in the world? <laughs> you know that I'm in New York right now? I'm just about to go to sleep, dreaming dreaming that I'm here uh, in, in front of this great audience here in Chicago. Come on, give me a break. But anyway, let me talk about the space program and the early days. We had great pioneers like Robert Garter, but people laughed at him. The idea that you could go to the moon, 
that you could go to Mars was considered preposterous. In fact, the New York Times would continually make fun of him. They denounced him. They called him a fraud. They said he should be fired from his professorship. Why? Because the New York Times said, rockets cannot move in outer space. Oh, really? Well, in 1969, when two men walked on the moon, years after Robert Gardner died, the New York Times finally wrote an apology. Oops, it is possible to move in outer space. Yes. So why did Robert Goddard endure the criticism, the jokes, the snickering, the humiliation? Why? Why do we have all these visionaries dreaming about something even though other people laugh? It's because when Robert Goddard the father of rocketry. When he was a young child, he read a book, a book that changed his life. It was called War of the Worlds. And he dreamed, he dreamed that one day his rockets would take us to Mars. And he was correct. The ballistic missile created by Robert Goddard has indeed sent robots to Mars. And then we had another young boy who read Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars series. That young boy was Carl Sagan, and he decided to become an astronomer because he read about Mars, the fact that it was something that captured the imagination of young people. And then, when I was a kid, there was also a book that captured my imagination, also the imagination of a young boy called Elon Musk. The book was called The Foundation, The Foundation Trilogy, about establishing a galactic empire. And Elon Musk goes on to start SpaceX to create his own moon rockets. Think about that. A private individual financing a new generation of rockets. In fact, you may know this, next year, we're going back to the moon. That's right, after a 50-year gap, we're going back to the moon. NASA has the SLS booster rocket. Elon Musk, just today, test-fired his rocket again, the Falcon Heavy. It is fully capable of going to the moon with astronauts. And then, the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos. Well, the former richest man in the world. He has created the Blue Origin rocket program. The new Armstrong will also go to the moon. And the Chinese have the Long March, Mar Mar Ma Long March rocket. So we have four, four programs to go back to the moon. We're gonna have a traffic jam around the moon. And in fact, I personally believe that one day our grandkids We'll honeymoon on the moon. Now, some people say, but why? Why bother to leave the Earth anyway? It's expensive? Yeah, but prices are dropping. Rockets are now going to be reusable. The Falcon Heavy, which was just test fired, the Falcon Heavy, it, all three rockets came back safely back to the planet Earth. Let's do a science experiment. Let's get into your car in the morning, drive to work, and then throw your car into the garbage. <laughs> that would bankrupt America if every time you use the car, you junked it. But that's what we do with rockets. We junk rockets after one use, and this is gonna change the economics of space travel. But we also have to worry about the Earth. You see, we face several threats. One of them, of course, is global warming. This is a problem that we Earthlings have to solve on the Earth. We cannot go to Mars to escape global warming. And look at this. Every glacier is receding. Summertime is a week longer than normal. Think about it. Sea levels are rising around the world. Not to mention the fact that two weeks ago, two weeks ago, 
a rock from space, went barreling into the atmosphere, broke up over the Bering Sea, not too far from Russia. It had the energy of 10 Hiroshima bombs. Think about that, the energy of 10 Hiroshima bombs blowing up in the atmosphere just two, two weeks ago. We are defenseless, defenseless against meteor impacts like this. We cannot depend on Bruce Willis <laughs> to save us with the space shuttle because first of all, there is no space shuttle. The space shuttle was canceled. Second of all, the space shuttle cannot go into deep space. And why am I making such a big thing about it? Because you know, the dinosaurs, <laughs> the dinosaurs did not have a space program. And that's why they're not here today. How come we don't have dinosaurs here today? It's because they do not have a space program. And sometimes when I see pictures like this, I wonder what's going on in this dinosaur's mind? He's probably saying to himself, oh shit. Yes, 65 million years ago, they got wiped out. And just last week, just last week, paleontologists unveiled a fossil bed of bones of the fish and dinosaurs who died on that very day. This day, the day 65 million years ago, when that asteroid plowed into the Yucatan of Mexico, Remnants of that, a whole bed of fossils has been discovered dating back to that exact day when that object hit the Earth. So yes, it's something that we have to worry about because if a rock of that size hits the Earth, it'll really ruin your day. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that when you go to Yellowstone, yes, we all know about Yogi Bear, but did you know that underneath Yellowstone, there's a monster, a super volcano. And if it were to explode, it would tear the guts out of the United States of America. Now you may say to yourself, well, that's pretty rare, right? Well, no. You see, it turns out that 75,000 years ago in Indonesia, the Toba volcano erupted the greatest eruption in 100 million years. Why is that important? Because it turns out that 75,000 years ago, for reasons that we don't quite understand, humanity almost died. We almost faced total extinction 75,000 years ago. How many of us survived? A few hundred maybe a few thousand. I think about this late at night. A few hundred people, maybe a thousand, escaped a cataclysm 75,000 years ago. What was it? We're not sure, but we think it could have been the Toba volcano, which wiped, almost wiped out humanity itself. Literally, we are all brothers and sisters. Only a few hundred of us repopulated the entire planet Earth. Amazing story. But as I said before, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. And you know, extinction is the norm. 99.9% .9 of all life forms eventually go extinct. Now, when we think of Mother Nature, we think Mother Nature is warm, cuddly, cute, yeah. Mother Nature is that way, but Mother Nature is also merciless. 99.9% .9 of all life forms eventually go extinct. If you don't believe me, dig right under your feet. That's right, right under your feet, dig, and you'll find the bones, the fossils of 99.9% .9 of all life forms that walked, once walked on the surface of the earth. But now we're entering the second golden age of space travel. You know, the first golden age was rather primitive. You know that your cell phone, 
Your cell phone today has more computer power than all of NASA in 1969 when they put two men on the moon. Ever see these old videotapes? They had 64K processors. You only find them in museums. And that's what NASA was using to shoot astronauts in space. In fact, I think it was criminal. Criminal what NASA was doing, shooting astronauts into outer space backed up by one cell phone. Ah, <sighs> criminal. But now, Silicon Valley billionaires, a new energy has come into play. We had the Falcon Heavy rocket, and it's gonna be replaced by an even bigger rocket. The biggest rocket on the books is being pioneered by SpaceX. The biggest rocket capable of going to Mars is called the BFR. B stands for big. <laughs> R stands for rocket. <laughs> F stands for your imagination. <laughs> and NASA, not to be outdone, has its rocket. It is called the SLS booster with the Orion space capsule. Next year, sometime in 2020, we hope to send it to the moon and realize that we now are talking about a fleet of these rockets. Not just NASA, not just SpaceX, but Blue Horizon, sponsored by the guy who created Amazon, the Chinese, maybe even the Russians. So we're talking about a traffic jam, traffic jam around the moon. You know, to go to the moon is a hop, skip, and a jump. Three days, just three days, you're on the moon. I think eventually the moon will become a tourist destination. People will vacation on the moon, have honeymoons on the moon. People will realize that yes, the moon is in our backyard. And beyond that, a more ambitious program is to go to Mars. This was the dream of Goddard. This was the dream of von Braun, the guy who built the V2 rocket and created the Saturn rocket. Now, of course, going to Mars is no picnic. It takes about a two years, two years for a round trip mission to Mars. And once you're on Mars, the goal is to create a self-sustainable colony that's not going to be a drain on the planet Earth. You know, the Apollo space program cost 5% of the federal budget in 1969. That is unsustainable. In, 19, in 1960s, the Apollo space program consumed 5% of every tax dollar that taxpayers pay to the government. That's unsustainable. We want a self-sufficient settlement on Mars. For example, ice can be melted. Ice, plenty of ice on Mars. Ice can be melted for drinking water, separate out for oxygen for breathing, and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So ice is the first thing to be mined, and then an artificial farm could be created using genetically modified algae. Algae, plants, have already been modified so they can thrive in the Martian conditions. It's awfully cold on Mars, very little carbon dioxide, but plants love carbon dioxide. And then beyond that, this is now into the next century, we want to melt the polar ice caps. You see, if you can raise the temperature of Mars by six degrees, that's right, just six degrees, you can create a runaway greenhouse effect. The polar ice caps will melt, and it'll be possible to have agriculture, and will terraform Mars. Now, some people think that terraforming is too difficult. Well, realize that we are terraforming the Earth right now. For worse, not for better, we are now terraforming the Earth. We're changing the atmosphere of the Earth. And we could also do that to Mars. So, we have 
one billionaire pushing SpaceX, another billionaire from Amazon pushing his fleet of rockets, and now we have Google billionaires, and they're pushing mining the asteroid belt. They want to pay for the exploration of outer space by mining platinum and rare earth elements in asteroids to make money, to create a gold rush in outer space. You know, for example, that when Thomas Jefferson, 200 years ago, when Thomas Jefferson signed the Louisiana Purchase and bought a huge chunk of land from Napoleon, Thomas Jefferson in his notes said that it would take a thousand years, a thousand years to settle the Louisiana Purchase. Wrong. <laughs> we did it in 50 years. Why was this gigantic barren land suddenly colonized? Because in 1848, they discovered gold, gold in California, and that accelerated the colonization of the West. Same thing could happen with the asteroid belt. And then, how do we refuel our rockets in deep space? It turns out that one of the moons of Saturn, Titan, has an atmosphere made of methane and ethane. In other words, gas. We have a gas station in outer space. Believe it or not, a gas station in outer space. Who would have thought that? But that's what the atmosphere of Titan is all about. And then beyond that, there are 4,000 exoplanets that some of them look very much like the Earth. In fact, tonight, just go outside tonight, look in the sky. We now know that on average, on average, every single star you see at night has a planet going around it. Amazing. And maybe one day, we'll even encounter other spacefaring civilizations, alien civilizations in outer space. Well, I'm on radio, and sometimes people call me on the telephone, and they say, Professor, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. The aliens are not just out there. The aliens are here. They're on the Earth. And so I ask them on radio, I ask them, how do you know that the aliens are here? And they tell me, they've been kidnapped. They've been kidnapped by aliens from out of space. And I tell them a word of advice. The next time you are kidnapped by a flying saucer, for God's sake, steal something. <laughs> a microchip, an alien scissors, an alien paperclip, anything. There is no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial civilization. <laughs> no law whatsoever. You're not going to go to jail if you steal from an alien from outer space, and you'll have bragging rights, bragging rights. Now, some people say, ha, huh, then what about these strange things that the military, military pilots have been tracking? Things that go zigzagging in the atmosphere, traveling faster than any known jet. What are they? Well, there's a theory. It was um, pretty much reinforced last year when Vladimir Putin of Russia announced the fact that they're testing a new generation of weapons called hypersonic drones. They go five to 20 times the speed of sound and they zigzag. Why do they zigzag? Because they can evade a Star Wars defensive shield by confusing the radar, by zigzagging. Maybe that's what's causing this flurry of flying saucer sightings. We should also point out that there's another theory. One theory is that, well, maybe these UFO stories are real. But there's another theory, and that is that about 10% of the human race suffers from sleep paralysis. Now, when you dream at night, you are paralyzed. That's right. You're paralyzed at night. Otherwise, you would act out your dream. You would sleepwalk, and you could hurt yourself. 
That's why we are paralyzed when we dream at night. But 10% of us, when we wake up in the morning like this, we're still paralyzed. We think that there is a gremlin sitting on our chest, staring down on us, and we cannot move. We're trapped by this gremlin. Now, during the Victorian era, they didn't know about aliens, but they all knew about gremlins. There are all these paintings during the Victorian era, all these paintings of people in a dream state thinking that there is a gremlin sitting on their chest. About 10% of us have that. In fact, I asked my students to raise their hand, and yeah, about 10% raise their hand that when they wake up in the morning, they are paralyzed. Let me ask you, how many of you have ever had an episode of sleep paralysis? Well, yeah, there you go, about 10%. So some people think that that's the origin of the abduction from alien syndrome. But anyway, my colleague Stephen Hawking would like to send a chip to the stars, the first starship. The chip would be hooked up to a parachute. The parachute would be hooked up to a laser beam. The laser beam shoots its energy, inflates the sail, and sends a chip to the nearby stars. That could be done in this century, the first starship. Can you imagine somebody from outer space sending that starship to you? you? You go outside, you're gardening one day, and a little parachute comes down with a microchip this big, and it is somebody from the stars trying to communicate with us. Well, we have bigger plans. This is a ramjet fusion engine. It scoops up hydrogen in the forward direction. It's like an ice cream cone. Think of an ice cream cone. It sucks in hydrogen from the forward direction, fuses it, burns it, and then creates rocket thrust forever. This rocket can go into outer space forever. These are called ramjet fusion engines. They could reach maybe about 50% the speed of light. But wouldn't you want to go even faster than that? This, this, of course, requires yet another leap in technology. And this requires the energy of a wormhole. As I said before, in 1916, in 1916, over 100 years ago, Physicists analyzed Einstein's equation and said, there is a monster. There is a monster in your equations. Because if a star or a galaxy were to collapse, it would collapse, warp the fabric of time, warp the fabric of space, rip it, and create a black hole. So a black hole is an object that is so powerful that it rips to shreds anything that comes too close. In fact, as you get closer and closer to a black hole, your legs are attracted faster than your head, and you start to become spaghetti. You are spaghettified as you get closer and closer to the black hole. Not a very pleasant sensation turning into spaghetti as you get closer. But next, once we identify these black holes in space, what's next? Next is, we want to know what's on the other side of forever. It turns out that if you take Einstein's equation seriously, and you then begin to look on the other side of a black hole, the equations say that there is a white hole on the other side of a black hole. How does it work? Well, it turns out that when you squeeze a star and the star is spinning, it's a spinning star, it collapses not to a dot. That's the old fashioned picture. Nope, not a dot. It collapses to a ring shown here, a ring. And if you fall through the ring, you do not die. You go all the way through the ring to a parallel universe called a white hole. And where have you seen that before? It turns out that over 100 years ago, there was a mathematician at Oxford University who talked about this. 
He couldn't write it for other adults, so he wrote it as a children's book. And he had to use another name because he was a professor of mathematics at Oxford. He called himself Lewis Carroll. The novel he wrote was called Through the Looking Glass, and his true name was Charles Dodgson. Charles Dodgson was the first one in the English language to entertain the idea that on the other side of the looking glass, there is another universe, another universe on the other side of the black hole. Now, let me try to wind up, because I want to sign your book. By the way, after I sign your book, you can go to eBay and auction them off for money. <laughs> yes, you can actually make money on today's talk. But let me quickly wrap up and by saying the following. When I was a child, when I was eight years old, something happened which changed my life. I still remember when I was eight years old, the newspapers all blared the fact that a great scientist had just died. And they put a picture, a picture that evening, a picture that mesmerized me. It was just a picture of his desk with a book an unfinished book opened up, and the caption said, this is the unfinished manuscript of the greatest scientist of our time. So I said to myself, why couldn't he finish that book? What's so hard? It's a homework question, right? Why didn't he ask his mother? What could be so hard that the greatest scientist of our time couldn't finish it? I went to the library, and I found out that this man's name was Albert Einstein, and that he was trying to write an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that would unify all the laws of physics and allow, and allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. And I said to myself, wow, that's for me. This is greater than any murder mystery. I had to know what was in that book. Today I can read that book. That's what I work on. That's my day job. That's what I do for a living, working on something called string theory. String theory, you probably know, is what they talk about on the Big Bang Theory on CBS TV. <laughs> but it's a real theory. String theory simply says that all matter consists of tiny, tiny little vibrating strings. Each vibration is a particle. So this would be an electron. This would be a neutrino. This would be a quark. It's the same string. But when it vibrates in a different way, it turns into a different particle. That's why we have so many of them. So what is a particle? A particle is a vibration on a tiny string. What is physics? Physics is the harmonies you can write on a string. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the melodies you can play on vibrating strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of strings. And then what is the mind of God? The mind of God is cosmic music. Cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. That is the mind of God. And then when I was in high school, I decided to put some of this knowledge to use, to do something. So I went to my mom. And I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? <laughs> a 2.3 million electron volt betatron particle accelerator in the garage. My mother stared at me, and she said, sure, <laughs> why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. Well, I took out the garbage. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel from Essinghouse. 22 miles of copper wire from Varian, and I built a six kilowatt, 2.3 million electron volt particle accelerator in the garage. Every time I plugged it in, I heard this pop, pop, pop sound as I blew out every single circuit breaker in the house. The whole house would be plunged in darkness. My poor mom, she must have said to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays basketball? Maybe if I buy him a baseball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? <laughs> why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, that's string theory. 
But let me now tell you my favorite Einstein story, and then we'll wind up and take questions from the audience. My favorite Einstein story is, when Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache, I will put on a wig, I will be the great Einstein, and you can take a rest and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question, and Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience, and we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, folks. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're going to bring up the lights here. Um, and if everyone who has a question, we've got a mic on either aisle. Uh, if you don't mind lining up, and we'll go alternating back and forth uh, with our questions. OK, so are we all set to go for the first question? Okay, Professor, thanks for a very enlightening speech today. Um, which do you think is more likely, time travel or breaking down the molecular structure like they did in uh, Star Trek to, to travel? So traveling instead of uh, using rockets. So and, and what time frame? Which do you think is more uh, plausible, time travel or breaking down the molecular structure to travel like they did in uh, Star Trek, and what time frame? <laughs> okay, you ask a very difficult question. Let's break it down one by one. First of all, teleportation. We can teleport atoms. We've teleported atoms of cesium and strontium. We've teleported photons of light. One day we will teleport atoms to the moon. That's definitely in the cars, teleporting to the moon. But a human, a human consists of trillions upon trillions upon trillions of atoms. So it'll take centuries before we can teleport Captain Kirk across a room. Second, you're talking about time travel. It turns out that Einstein's equations do allow for time travel. However, you have to open up the gateway shown here. The gateway requires the energy of a black hole. We are far, far away from harnessing the energy of a black hole. The black hole will open up a gateway, shown here, but then you have to have negative energy to stabilize it. And negative energy is very exotic and also quite difficult to get. So it may take millennia before we have the energy necessary to play with black holes to open up a gateway through space and time. But remember that Star Trek takes place in what, in the 23rd century? So we still have a few hundred years to go. But don't hold your breath. We're talking about an energy scale beyond human comprehension. The energy of a black hole necessary to rip the fabric of space and time, shown here, to give us a way to go through space and time. But again, time travel is a solution of Einstein's equations. Many books get this wrong because they don't understand the whole theory. Einstein himself realized that wormholes are possible in 1935. Einstein himself wrote the first paper on wormholes introducing that concept. And in 1949, his office mate, Kurt Gödel, found the first time travel solution of Einstein's equations. Okay, let's go for the next question. Yeah? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, recently, NASA has been able to show um, people through their website all the satellites we have in space. With all the pollution that's out there, um, and recently Neil deGrasse Tyson also mentioned that we're causing a lot of pollution, not just on Earth, but also in space. Um, what is your take on how you know, that's gonna evolve in the future and you know, how we should clean all that up if we're also polluting space and making space garbage? Uh, yes, we are definitely polluting everywhere we go. 
And yes, it is a problem, but it's a problem that is solvable. It takes will, political will, will through democratic vote. We have to vote for candidates who will then try to clean up our mess. And just remember that when we go to the moon and go to Mars, we'll have a whole other planet to mess up. So we have to be careful about that. You're absolutely right to make sure that we don't uh, corrupt other planets. The first thing is we may corrupt Mars with our life forms. We have to make sure that Mars is sterile, that Mars does not have its own DNA that would then interfere with our DNA. And so we have, to, we have to worry about that, yes. That wherever we go, we take our garbage with us. But the solution to that is political. And that is we have to vote for candidates who want to clean up the mess that we create. Okay, next. Thank you, Professor. What do you think is gonna have the greater impact on humanity? Artificial intelligence or gene editing through CRISPR? Uh, the question is, what's going to have the biggest impact, uh, AI or CRISPR genetic modification of the human species? I think both of them are going to change everything. I think that, first of all, science is the engine of prosperity and wealth. All the wealth we see around us is a consequence of science and technology. But science comes in waves. The first wave was the steam engine which gave us the Industrial Revolution, locomotives, cars. The second revolution was the Electric Revolution, which gave us electricity, television, gave us dynamos and generators. The third revolution was high-tech, transistors, lasers coming from the quantum theory. But now we're entering the fourth wave, the fourth wave of wealth generation beyond steam power beyond electricity, beyond computers. The fourth wave is physics at the molecular level. That means artificial intelligence, that means nanotechnology and biotechnology. So they're gonna change everything. Even our bodies, our cells, the job market, everything is gonna change with the coming of artificial intelligence and the coming of biotechnology. Now, then the next question is, well, are the, are the robots going to take over? Let me just say a few things about that. Elon Musk says that, yes, the danger is the robots are going to take over. We are creating our evolutionary successors. However, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook says, wait, artificial intelligence is going to give us prosperity, jobs, new economic forms of wealth generation. I think both are correct. I think in the short term, Musk is correct. For decades to come, artificial intelligence will create new job opportunities, uh, new industries, new potentials, but by late in this century, let's not fool ourselves, late in this century, robots could become self-aware. At that point, they could be dangerous. Now, our most advanced robot today is called Asimo. You've seen him on television. He runs, walks, dances, climbs upstairs. I interviewed the creator of Asimo for BBC television. And I asked the inventor, how smart is the world's smartest robot? And he was honest. He said, Asimo has the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach, <laughs> a lobotomized, stupid cockroach. He can barely walk across the room. But eventually, robots will be as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then as smart as a rabbit, then as smart as a dog or a cat, and then finally as smart as a monkey, and that is potentially dangerous by the end of the century. Because you see, monkeys are self-aware. Monkeys know they are not human. Now dogs, dogs are confused. Dogs think that we are a dog. They think we're the top dog, and they're the underdog. So monkeys have no illusions. Monkeys know they are monkeys, and they're not humans. And so we should, when robots become that smart, I think we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. 
We need a fail-safe system for that. Now, biotechnology also promises us such tremendous advances, but there's no simple solution. In fact, it's gonna get worse. In the future, a high school kid will get on a typewriter, type ATCG, ATCG, and create a virus in his living room. That is a real danger. The CRISPR technology will become so advanced that we'll create genetic typewriters that can simply type and create new forms of life. For example, if you take the AIDS virus and make it airborne, airborne AIDS would kill 98% of the human race. So there is a danger there. So CRISPR technology has to be looked at very carefully not because we have to wait 100 years, but because in the coming decades, high school kids will have the potential to create life. Okay, next. Hey there, so this is gonna be our last question. Last question. After we are done, we are having a book signing out in the lounge, book signing in the lounge, thank you. Okay, last question. Thank you, Professor. What do you believe the impact of colonization of space on other planets will be in terms of the conflicts that we see on planet Earth. Do you believe that conflicts, geopolitical conflicts in the future will be worse because we have colonies in other places, or do you think we will whiz them up and have less conflict on our home planet? Well, unfortunately, conflict is part of our evolutionary makeup, okay? But let me, let me say this. For many decades to come, maybe even a century or two centuries, we're simply talking about a settlement, a self-sufficient settlement on Mars. Now, beyond that, then we can talk about a civilization perhaps springing up on Mars, but that is way beyond the projections that we're talking about today. We're talking about the fact of a self-sufficient settlement, maybe a few thousand people. Musk talks about maybe a million people. But again, there are technical financial obstacles to that. Now, if you were to fast forward centuries into the future now, then perhaps a new branch of civilization could get started. But that is way beyond our projections. Right now, the people that are doing the planning for this simply want an insurance policy, a backup plan, plan B, just in case an asteroid ruins your day, just in case a nuclear proliferation, the greenhouse effect, spin out of control, we want to be at least a two-planet species because otherwise we're putting all our eggs in one basket. Now, what would that mean in the far future? I don't know. But I think for centuries to come, we're simply talking about a settlement, a self-sufficient settlement on Mars. Okay, well, thank you so much. It's been a great honor to be here today, and I will sign your books. And then you go to eBay. Thank you, Professor.